Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. When you follow Christ, there's a lot of privileges that you get that everybody else won't get, but there's also some sacrifices that we will need to make in order to fully please God and fully follow Him. John 5, 41. I really like this scripture. Look at this. I receive not glory from men. I crave no human honor. I look for no mortal fame. Now, that's Jesus talking. I want you to focus on the word crave. I never really spotted that until I was meditating on this today. It's like, there's nothing wrong with wanting people to like you. That's a pretty natural, normal emotion. I hope you like me. You know? I mean, we all want, you know. I hope that you're pleased by what I say tonight. I hope I don't say anything that offends you. We all want to be well-liked, well but I don't crave it. See? I don't have to have it. There was a time when I did. And when you're like that, you look at people, and if you're not getting their approval, then you start changing what you're doing. Come on. You'll change your haircut. You'll change your clothing style. How many preachers do you think there are that don't really preach what they believe God is putting in their mouth? Because they're concerned if they do, they'll lose, lose part of their congregation. Far too many. And it offends God when we bow down to the fear of man rather than following God. Amen? I don't want to offend anybody, but you know what? Jesus offended people all the time. It seemed to be his specialty, actually. Matter of fact, it was almost like he did it on purpose. You know, I think he purposely got in the middle of the Pharisees and healed a man on the Sabbath day just to get them all stirred up. Amen? So, I, you know, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what it is that God's trying to do with me, but I think I'm just kind of unique enough and bold enough that, well, you know, here I am, deal with it or whatever you want to do, but... You know, here it is. You know what? I don't think anything amazes me any more than the people that God uses. It just makes you want to laugh. Sometimes it makes you want to cry. Don't let the fear of man steal your destiny. Don't crave human honor. I love the scripture where Jesus said, where it says that Jesus made himself of no reputation. Don't you like that? It was kind of like he just right out of the gate got that one over with. I want you to think with me tonight. Are you living to please God? Every day. That's what it means to be a Christian, that we live for him that we live for him. It doesn't mean we have a bumper sticker and hang a cross around our neck and join a denomination. It means that we follow him. Jesus said, if anybody is gonna be my disciple, <laughs> let him take up his cross and follow me. And maybe that cross is not being as popular with the world as you used to be. But you know what? If you lose 10 friends, God will give you 10,000 back at some other time in your life. Colossians 1.10. That you may walk, live, and conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him and desiring to please Him in all things. Boy, we could stop right there and do a four-part series. <laughs> do we desire to please God in all of our conversation? 
Yet we desire to please God in all of our secret thought life. Do we desire to please God in the way we dress? <laughs> Y'all are kind of looking around like... Just going to let that one hang there for a minute. <laughs> My, everybody does it. <laughs> Look at me. You ain't everybody. <laughs> and when you follow Christ, there's a lot of privileges that you get that everybody else won't get, but there's also some sacrifices that we will need to make in order to fully please God and fully follow Him. Amen? So I'll, I'll leave that with you for homework. I know I'm probably making you guys kind of nervous, but, well, not really. You kind of knew what you'd get when you came. So. that you may walk, live, and conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him and desiring to please Him in all things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the glad tidings of the gospel, so we speak not to please men, but to please God. I have to tell you that to the very best of my ability, when I come up here, I, I do believe that I say whatever God puts in my mouth. And probably sometimes that's why it's a bit like... See, it's really kind of sad when you get right down to it that, that we could sit here tonight and say, I know I'm doing things that doesn't please God. Aren't you glad you came tonight? Yeah. Because you see, here, here's the thing. The reason why I'm bold enough to say this is because the more we please God, the happier we are. It's like, yes, you may give up something on the fleshly side, but you get something in the spiritual side of your life. And I do believe that I think the higher that we come up spiritually, there's always a little bit more of our flesh that has to go to the cross. And it is a process. We're always making decisions. Our path gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And for whatever God sent you far here tonight, tonight he's trying to narrow it up a little bit more. But it's not to take anything away from anybody. It's to give you what you've been asking for. Where's my joy? I want more peace. I know, man, been there, done that. Went around those mountains a million times. The fear of rejection, the fear of being rejected by people is a, it's a terrible thing. And to be honest with you, rejection is very painful. You know, I can stand here now and glibly say that I got asked to leave my church. I lost all my friends and, and even family members who did not totally did not agree with our decision to leave the denomination that we were in. I mean, they just did not agree. And, I, you know, I'm not, I mean, I would have been happy to have stayed, but they put me out. <laughs> so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't really like leaving. It was like go or shut up, and shutting up wasn't an option for me then, so... <laughs> Probably didn't, I, I probably didn't use the most wisdom in the world. You know, sometimes when the fire of God hits you, you're not, you don't act like the smartest <laughs> block in the box, but it's... But you know, I think God would rather have a little wildfire than no fire at all. And so, I mean, you know, it took a while, but I kind of got straightened out and got on the right track. And I, you know, I look back now and think, well, I probably shouldn't have said that. I probably shouldn't have done that. But my heart was right, and certainly it wasn't worth everybody rejecting me. But here, let me tell you, I can stand here and tell you now, well, I lost my friend, you know, and it's like, oh, well, 
But it was painful. I mean, it was gut-wrenchingly painful. Rejection is painful. And to be honest, I look back now, and I, I have to honestly say that I really don't know how I did it because back then I cared a lot about what people thought of me. It had to only be by the grace of God that I was able to do that. But I remember, I actually remember kneeling down in my kitchen floor and I had just listened to a teaching about righteousness. And I, mean, I, I never heard anything like that. I'm righteous. I never, I never heard that. All I ever heard was I was a terrible, miserable, rotten sinner. I'm right with God. I'm not wrong with God. So I'd listen to a teaching on righteousness, and I didn't even really understand it. My head didn't really understand it. The teacher was teaching out of 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he that knew no sin became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. It's not, when we say I'm righteous, it's not like I'm righteous in my own works. I do things wrong all the time. But we've been given the righteousness of God, and, and the Bible says we need to put it on and wear it like a robe. So if you're going to put it on and wear it, you got to claim it, and you got to know who you are in Christ. And it's in Christ, in Christ. It's not in us. It's in Christ. But anyway, I had listened to this teaching, and man, something was happening in me. My head didn't even understand it, but something was happening in me. Now I had all these threats of loss, and I had a decision to make. I had a decision to make. And I don't know if it's somebody watching by television or somebody in here, but you know that God's trying to do something in your life. Perhaps you know that God has a call on your life. Perhaps you know that God is asking you to step out and do something that you know that people are not going to understand. You're not even 100% for sure that you're hearing from God, but it just seems like he won't leave you alone. <laughs> And we're going to talk a lot more this weekend about that fear of making mistakes. Let me tell you something interesting. If you're never willing to be at risk, you will never mature spiritually. I was very much at risk and very vulnerable. And I say, when I made that decision, but really, it was Dave and I together. And, you know, Dave doesn't really care much what people think, so he had a plus on his side. And I don't mean that in a bad way. He just doesn't. He's like, well, not my responsibility what they think. I wish that I had that, but I've had to suffer it through with Jesus, probably just so I could teach you. It's your fault. It's not mine. But I'm trying to make a point that that was hard for me to not just, okay, I'll be quiet. Sure, yeah, I understand. Don't want to make any waves. I'll be quiet. But I made it through the middle, and now I'm enjoying the end. Amen? I love that whole thought of making it through the middle. So many great scriptures in the Word of God. So many wonderful things. The devil uses rejection at every place of progress in your life to try to get you not to take the next step. How many of you sense that there's a next step coming up for you? Well, I hope that what you're hearing tonight, the word of God that you're hearing is helping you make a decision to live courageously and go ahead and step out and find out. And I'm not suggesting at all doing foolish things or silly things or, or, or crazy things. You know, if 20 spiritually mature people are telling you you're making a mistake, then maybe you better back off and pray a little bit more. But if it's just a bunch of people that 
aren't following God anyway. And, you know, I mean, you got to you got to look at the source of where your opposition is coming from. I'm not advocating being rebellious and never listening to anybody, but I don't think there's anything worse than trying to live the life you think somebody else wants you to live. Trying to be like they want you to be and like they want you to be and like they want you to be and like they want you to be. And, like you to be. and pretty soon you don't, you've lost yourself. You don't even know what you're supposed to be. Doing hard things is good for us. It really is. Don't think that because something's hard, that means you ain't supposed to do it. God purposely puts hard things in our path. And the Bible says in Isaiah 41, I will harden you to difficulties. Let's look at Isaiah 41.10. You know, what does your baby want to chew on when they're cutting teeth? Something hard. <laughs> What does your puppy want to chew on when they're cutting teeth? Well, we're cutting spiritual teeth, and we have to do it on hard things, difficult things. Amen? Where did I tell you to go? Isaiah 41.10. This is such, such a great piece of Scripture. Fear not, there's nothing to fear. <laughs> For I am with you. You know, that's really the only reason God ever gives to not live in fear is I'm with you. Don't look around you in terror and be dismayed. For I am your God. I will strengthen and harden you to difficulties. I will strengthen and harden you to difficulties. I will strengthen and harden you to difficulties. You know what that means? Things that are really hard for you right now, five years from now, won't bother you at all. I mean, they won't bother you at all. But they'll continue to bother you five years from now if you run away from them now. So it really depends. Do you want to be the same as you are five years from now? Or do you want to go through with God, live at risk a little bit, you know why I say it's good for us to be at risk? Because that's the only way we can ever find out what God will do for us and what he won't. I put myself out there. When I walked out of my job, when I felt like God was telling me to go into this ministry. And by the way, I was 42 when I started this ministry and had three teenagers and a baby. So please don't tell me you can't do anything for God because you're too old or you got too many kids or, you know. Let me tell you something. Passion for God will drive you to do crazy stuff. Amen? But I found out that God would support me. I found out that God would open doors for me. I found out that God will replace those friends that I lost. Because I put myself at risk. I found that, yes, there was a possibility that I was wrong and maybe God wouldn't come through at all. But there's no place worse to live than in that gray area. In the safe zone. Fear not, there's nothing to fear. Now, in closing this evening, I'm going to read you four scriptures. We're going to, I'm actually not going to read them to you. We're going to look at them together. And I'm trusting God that as we look at these, something is going to happen in your heart that's going to help you make a decision that God is greater than any person that you know. And if God is for you, which he is, I said, which he is, Yes, I'm talking to you. Yes, even you sinner, God is for you. To be honest with you, even the person who hasn't even committed your life to Christ yet, God is for you. He's calling you tonight. He's wooing you tonight. God is for you. And if God be for me, who can be against me?
if God is on my side, whom shall I fear? Now, patiently, let's look at these. Romans 8, 31 and 32. Now, the word of God has power in it to set you free if you receive it in a spirit of meekness. What then shall we say to all of this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be our foe if God is on our side? Psalm 118, 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? I mean, really think about it. I mean, I wrote down, okay, what can man do? They can talk about me. They can think bad things about me. I mean... People go around thinking bad stuff about you all the time anyway, so, you know. <laughs> they can reject me. They can say they don't want to be my friend. They, they cannot invite me to the party. Maybe it's my boss that doesn't like me. He cannot give me a promotion or not give me a raise. You say, well, what if they hurt me? What, what, what if somebody even killed me? You know, there's a scripture where God says, you better not just fear the people who can kill your body, <laughs> but you better fear the one who's in charge of eternity. <laughs> Amen? We don't deal with that much here in this country, the, the thought of dying for your faith, but it does go on all over the world. And I tell you the truth, us in the Western world, we better toughen up a little bit. <laughs> Because I think we're going to have to take a stand here pretty soon. And we may just lose a few perks. If we do. We've got to start making those decisions now. Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear or dread? The Lord is the refuge and the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And if I haven't pushed you over the edge yet, here comes the last one. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 6. So we take comfort and we are encouraged, and we confidently and boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be seized with alarm. I will not fear or dread or be terrified. What can man do to me? Amen. Come on, give God a big praise tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for filling us with courage. Amen. All right, I pray for all of you in the name of Jesus that whatever you need to confront, you will find the courage and the strength in God to do so at the right time and in the right way. That you will begin to live your God-ordained life and not just some counterfeit version to keep people happy. In Jesus' name. Amen. Are you living to please God every day? Are you following Him or other people? You know, I firmly believe that the more we live to please God, the happier we will be. But you know, in order to live to please God, you have to be a little bit of a courageous person because God may ask you to do some things that are uncomfortable for you. He may give you new opportunities that in order to take those opportunities, you've got to maybe be at risk a little bit. And you know, especially when it comes to not letting people give the direction to our lives, 
Sometimes we have to be willing to confront them or to stand up to the things that they want us to do. Extreme poverty is a huge problem in this area just outside of Hyderabad, India. But there are two young girls that we want to tell you about. Their names are Bhavana and Nandini, and they are facing something that is so difficult. The fact is, they are girls, and that's basically all it takes. My name is Nandini, I'm studying in fourth class. I have nine years old. My name is Priya Bhavana, I'm studying in ninth class. Uh, I, I am uh, 14 years old. 14 years old. What kind of problems are, are your family facing? My father is not there in my home. He is swimming outside. I am going to go to the house. I am going to go to the house. I God is taking care of you. Yes, uh, God is taking care about me in all my uh, necessities and He is giving me very good health. Then what do you like to do together? Uh, we will pray together every day and we'll pray, play every day. Whenever we have time, we'll make funny jokes, we'll sit, uh, study, and we'll learn about God. What does it mean to you when you come here to visit and you see your daughters are happy? As I'm sure you know, there are many parts of the world where simply being born a girl and not a boy makes life very difficult. India is one of those places. Together we can make a difference, and we are. The girls that you see behind me are part of our Hand of Hope sponsored children's home. And we're able to not only keep them in a safe place, an environment that is loving, but to let them know that what society says about them is not true, that it's what God says about them that matters. They are valuable and they are loved. You are helping make this possible. Don't ever look at a situation and think it's too big to make a change. Together, we are making a change, and we thank you for being part of it. Werk, huishouden, vrije tijd en nog veel meer. Het moederschap is een fulltime uitdaging. Groeit alles je soms boven het hoofd? Krijg weer rust, zelfvertrouwen en vreugde die dieper gaat. Laat je inspireren door Joyce Meyer, zelf moeder van vier kinderen. Je hebt het verdiend. Het boek van Joyce Meyer, de zelfverzekerde moeder. Bestel je eigen exemplaar nu via joyce-meyer.nl of telefonisch via 026 2022 100.